Welcome to our How to Repair Pendulum Clocks live stream uh, event. Um, <laughs> always seems um, strange to be here kind of uh, broadcasting to uh, Andrew and Tony. Uh, good evening. Uh, warm welcome to you. Hope everybody's okay this evening. Um, we're going to be uh, doing a bit of drawing um, in relation to this slightly intractable um, deadbeat escapement thing. Uh, anyway, more of that in a bit. In the meantime, I thought I would uh, just show you this little bit of work holding that I've been doing. So during the week, or last week, I think it was, um, I was repairing uh, a fusey dial clock, uh, a bit like the one um, behind us here, but a bit smaller. And the uh, hand collet, uh, for that clock, you may, if you've watched our um, other event, the uh, the Open Clock Club, just put that on there for a second. Uh, if you've watched Open Clock Club, you'll know that I'm a bit paranoid about um, hand collets and the problem, I just tip them out into this uh, scruffy looking tray, um, is, oh, there's all sorts of, uh, I, good evening, Derek, um, there's all sorts of um, problems associated with uh, the hands and this clock that I worked on, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze, um, is uh, no different. The hands were wobbling about, the, neither the hour nor the minute hand was stable, they weren't flat, they'd been painted, so the paint was kind of getting underneath the hand uh, and it had these um, kind of these things here if you're familiar with these, but these are a kind of assortment of hand collets that you buy from materials houses, and they're very thin. I mean, they're, they're kind of okay. Uh, they get you out of a hole. Um, stamped brass, and there are some similar ones like that that are in steel. And uh, so it had two of those on, kind of stacked together, but they weren't giving the hands any... Hi, Jeremy. Um, good evening. Uh, they weren't giving the hands any stability. So, um, yeah, these uh, hand collets actually are quite nice, these old ones. I don't know whether they live together. Good old Arthur Challens, 58 Northampton Street, Birmingham. If anybody's in Birmingham, they need to pop round and see if they're still there and say we've um, still got six hand collets in stock. Anyway, the hand collet wasn't caught in the mustard. So um, a hand collet, you think, is like a really, really simple thing to make, which it kind of is, but um, it always has to be the correct depth. It only just wants to be drilled and then broached big enough to fit over the center. Um, it needs to be deep enough to provide the right amount of uh, tension from the friction work, um, but it also needs to be concave at the back. So... I don't know if I've got one here. If you were to put, uh, say, for instance, hi, Franklin. Uh, good to see you there from the Netherlands. If you were to put um, uh, a piece of, if you've got a lathe available, a piece of bar stock uh, in the lathe, got my clipboard somewhere. Here it is. Just thinking about drawing the escapement, which is um, kind of, as always, thinking on my feet. So if you uh, wanted to make a hand collet and you started with some um, bar material in the lathe, you need basically, a, uh, obviously you need a hole drilled in the middle. You need uh, a sticky out bit like this, little line like that, maybe like this. And then, uh, I don't know, something that ends up looking a bit like a flying saucer with a little edge on it. Um, so it's bigger than our stock. There's our stock. Uh, so that's all cool. You can do that. You can turn the lathe, you can drill a hole. Uh, you can turn this, turn that, turn that with a graver, no problem. Um, but then you need to turn it inside out. So if you've been clever, you can turn this parallel and you can just about get it to hold in a collet if you've got a collet available and then flip it round and turn the back away. If it's flat at the back, the hands won't sit flat. They'll tend to rock about. 
um, it needs to be, uh, let's just draw it here. So from the back, it needs to kind of be like uh, something like that, if that makes uh, sense. So it touches the hand only at its extremities and so on. Anyway, that's all well and good if you've got a lathe and a whole lot of collets to be able to part off the, the bar stock. I suppose you could start the other way around and you could turn the back first. So you would turn, um, uh, if this is a stock, start with a bit bigger this time, you would start by obviously drilling a hole through and then you would turn a divot in here so you would cut this bit away uh, and then you might part off the work with a parting tool and flip it round. But then you've of course got the problem of holding it. Well, you could try it on a spigot, which would be quite tricky. But anyway, what I'm getting at is that um, a thing that's incredibly useful. And I guess those of you that have lathes uh, will have tried this, but if you haven't tried it, and you are somebody is watching this in the future and you're just getting into lathes and turning of course the challenge with a lathe is always work holding um buying a lathe in the first place is well kind of the easy bit or not um but then it's then it's work holding and you might get your lathe and it might have a three jaw chuck um and a four jaw chuck let's say for instance and if you're lucky it's got some collets um, but uh, there are things called step collets, which, yeah, you could. In fact, I'll get mine. So in this um, instance, for the eight millimeter watchmaker's lathe, these are, they've obviously got an eight millimeter shank. So they fit in the headstock like this. And the, uh, the collet is split. You can see it's got three slots in it. So as you tighten the draw bar, the, um, the threaded bar that runs through the middle of the headstock, the collet closes down and squidges whatever you've got. And these are really useful and they make them for bigger lathes as well. The, uh, the, this particular set, they come in five sizes. So you've kind of got to go through the sizes like this until you find the one. It'd be easier actually if I put that on a bit of wood to hold, wouldn't it, like that? Now that's better. So you've kind of got to go through the sizes and find the one that's a good fit. It's probably that one. And then you, in theory, put that in there and then it closes down like that it's going to work yep and then you can see this holds the work reasonably uh reasonably concentric but be aware of anybody that tells you that collets are the answer to concentricity they're kind of well they're not is the answer they are better than um they're better than nothing um but they you can't rely on them to be perfectly concentric you can put a bit of work in there and then turn it um, but the minute you take it out and put it back in, it might be pretty good if your lathe is good and the collet hasn't been strained, but it's never going to be perfectly concentric, uh, perfectly concentric. So this is pretty cool, as you can see, but if you get a graver, I've got a chunky old graver here, but nevertheless, and put your T-rest up there, you can see you can turn, so it's going to jump out. Somebody filed a slot across this, I noticed, so it's a bit discontinuous cut. 
So you can turn in there, but obviously you can't get to the sides because the collet's in the way. So it's still awkward. So these things are quite useful, but they're um, like everything, I suppose, a little bit limited. So if we just get our collet out. So I was doing this clock anyway, repairing this clock, and I thought I've got a collet that's pre-made like this. So it's not stamped um, sheet material. It's actually turned uh, from solid and it's already, if you can see there, it's already convex, um, concave, sorry, on the back, which is what we want. So we want it to only touch at the edges. So I've got a file and put the thing on my finger and just filed it flat. And that also roughens up the edges a bit. So it doesn't just have a kind of point contact like that, if that makes any sense. Just filed it flat. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this thing called the wax chuck, which is um, what I'm banging on about. So all a wax chuck is, it's like the simplest thing in the world. You don't need collets to do this. Um, you can do it with a three jar chuck or any kind of work holding like that. Is a piece of, um, in this case, it's a piece of steel uh, with a bit of um, brass hard soldered on or pressed on or something like that. The whole thing could be brass, I suppose. It doesn't have to be steel and brass. And um, when I think you used to buy lathes, you would get these. But of course, if you've got a lathe, a slightly bigger one, anyway, you can just make them and they become a kind of consumable because in this case, I'm going to hold it in a collet like this and get a position where it's kind of reasonably concentric. It's not too bad. Um, then if you wanted, if the, the wax chuck, when you I think when you buy them new or you see them in those old lathe catalogs, they've kind of got concentric circles in them to make them grip the work easier. So, um, Let's just have a go at doing that. And of course, you could true it up in the same uh, process. Might see if I can find a pair of glasses that would help. help. And you would just get your tip of your grey bear and uh, make some concentric circles in there, which will not only flatten the face of the thing out, but it'll also um, give the cement something to grip onto like that. So you can see a dead easy thing to make um, in the home workshop, but it'll be useful. So this thing's called a wax chuck, although we don't use it with wax. I'm going to use it with shellac. I suppose you could use it with sealing wax. Um, but people, uh, I think it's also called a cement chuck um, because people will use it with uh, pitch or with super glue or with double sided tape, um, something like that. So it's pretty uh, flexible kind of device. So I'm just going to get some uh, shellac. Um, this is a lot of spec. Actually, I was ordering some um, materials today from um, HS Walsh, the jewellery suppliers, and I saw those soldering tweezers, the ones with the fibre handles, and for some reason I didn't actually buy any, which I should have done because they're incredibly useful for things like this where otherwise the work's going to get very hot. So shellac um, here, this is uh, like your typical sort of brown, had this for like donkey's ears and um uh it's just like regular sort of furniture shellac i suppose uh you can get the de-waxed stuff and uh, you can get um a blonde version which i think is sort of bleached um good supplier for that is uh cornelison's if you're ever up in london at the uh british museum 
Uh, if you wander down, uh, I think it's Great Russell Street from there, go to Cornelison's Artist Suppliers. They're absolutely brilliant. Uh, so I'm looking at my computer as well. Um, hello from Ontario, Canada. Great. Glad you could uh, join us. It's really fantastic. So, yeah, the, the wax chuck, really useful uh, work holding device. So if I can find my spirit lamp. It's all set fire to something. It wouldn't be. Uh, let's see it on there. It's completely in the way there. I suppose in another life, um, I can design um, a YouTube stroke um, live stream studio where there you kind of spin round or something, or you need a big rotating table so you can just put things on and move it all out of the way there must be a more efficient way of doing it so let's just uh fire up our spirit lamp which has gotten a bit i'm going to put the extractor on because um the uh fire alarms have already been set off about four times this week yeah hot glue uh you could use glue uh, at the college we used to lot use a lot of super glue um which was great and you can get it off just by boiling it up in water just wait for the extraction to come on let's get that across here a bit then it uh blocking the view hopefully that'll catch the fumes before they get up to the uh smoke alarm A bit noisy. Uh, so let's just fire this up. The smoke lamp goes off, then it takes a couple of minutes for a reset. And uh, let's get some shellac on here. A couple of flakes. Now, you don't want to burn the shellac, you only just want it to. Uh, melt so don't go bonkers heating it up really quickly now when i used to do this i used to have all sorts of problems with it and i think it's because i used one of those um like creme brulee type torches and it um never used to work properly so we don't want the shellac to burn do want it to you need it to be quite runny otherwise it just kind of stays in one yucky blob there we are so good practice for um that's it. Good practice for fitting those pallet stones on uh, like French clocks on what people call Broco uh, escapements. Always difficult uh, doing that. Hi, Brian. Missouri. Gosh, we've got a good old international audience today. Um, <laughs> I hope it's worth your while traveling all that way like 5,000, 6,000 miles or whatever it is. Um, so there's our um, collet glued on. Now, the problem with that, of course, is it's not yet, um, it's not yet uh, centered. So we have to do that in the lathe. It's a bit warm, so let's just cool it off a little bit, some water. Good. And yeah, that's cooled down. A bit for the lathe to go rusty. Let's go back to our chuck, pop it in there. Now you can see that the, let's just get this in focus if we can. You can see that the thing is wobbling about. So just put your uh, T rest up there. And wherever our pegwood is, 
if it's going to work or not. Just make it a bit blunter. So just file the wood to a blunt point. Um, like that, and we can rest it on the um, T rest. Let's move that a bit further away. And then what we do, is that going to work? Yeah, I think so. Is to warm up the uh, shellac again. I could do it with a lighter, I suppose. I will just use my spirit lamp again. Don't obviously want to get the headstock of the lid warm or hot anyway, but um, I don't think we will. Let's just get that under there if it doesn't actually. too hot. Now this is maybe where one of those little um, gas torches would be useful. Let's just see if we get in there. Oh. Yeah, starting to wiggle about a bit now. A little bit more. Right, and that should give us enough um, time to spin the lathe and get this thing concentric. Or thereabouts, anyway. A bit more. not very flat either but um the outside of this thing so let's have a look it's quite wobbly but the hole isn't too bad anyway you can see the principle if you're willing to fiddle get your torch under there um and then you the, the beauty of the shellac as opposed to something like super glue which we'll turn the extractor off is uh it just gives you that bit of time to be able to um to be able to manipulate the work. So this would be really cool if you were doing something like find a work on say an escape wheel for a carriage clock or uh, something like that, where you could turn uh, a recess in this bit of work in the wax chuck and you could let the escape wheel into there, put a tiny bit of shellac on, then you know that it's held concentric with the teeth, a bit like the boxwood chuck that we were talking about somewhere or other. And then, um, then you can bore out the wheel or something. So now uh, this gives us the ability. Let's imagine this is just a bit of material that we've cut off or sheet material either, drilled a hole in. We can hollow it out. We can flip it round. It's just really kind of um, flexible way to work. So I'll just turn it a bit just to. actually prove it works and so on. And then when you are done, I suppose the problem with this is you can't try it easily. So if you're measuring something for height, of course, you've got to unstick it and then try it and put it back on again. And with shellac, I say with super glue um, or with Dell's hot glue, uh, like a glue gun type glue, then obviously you can just heat it up again. Uh, with super glue, you put it in water and boil the water and that tends to break the glue down although sometimes it can be incredibly uh, strong joint. Um, it, with double-sided tape, you'd have to use white spirits. Uh, and with this, uh, you can soak it in methylated spirit because the shellac is soluble in methylated spirit. Um, but actually the quick way and slightly dangerous, you really need a hearth for this where you can control the fire, is just to put it in a bit of methylated spirit. And then again, with your spirit lamp, boil the mess and within a few minutes or in fact a few seconds the mess the um, shellac just dissolves and you've got got some um, got your component there so anyway so that was a little bit of a story from the coal face that i thought i would uh, share with you um when 
I uh, went online, so I have done the wax chuck. One day, hopefully, that will be incredibly useful to somebody who is struggling with work holding. Talking about work holding, I've got um, somebody sent me two wheels for repivoting, which I need to do uh, soon. So we've got um, a kind of easy one here, which is a, a clock with a lantern pinion. And the beauty of these uh, sort of 19th, 20th century wheels, of course, is that the arbor is parallel. So I can probably uh, hold this in a collet concentrically enough and there isn't too much overhang here. So I can flatten this off a little bit, find the center with a graver and then drill it and put a new pivot in. This is slightly more difficult because not only is the uh, arbor of this 19th century, early 19th century clock not parallel, but it's also, uh, even if I could hold it in a collet there, it's not that collet, it's not that pivot that's broken off. It's the other end. So all I can hope to do is, uh, is you know, hold it um, here or on this shoulder with a collet or maybe on the pinion, but on the shoulder is probably better for me just to drive it. And I've shown this on Open Clock Club. I'll use um, this device in the tailstock of the lathe. Uh, if we've got one here that's suitable size. I've got another plate that's smaller, which is here, this is this one. So this goes in the um, tailstock of the lathe. And uh, so the work goes in like this, and it's a little bit awkward, but you can see that you can see the pivot there through that hole. And that just it's held like this, that just gives you um, enough space to get your graver in there, find the center or drill the center if you, uh, if you wanted, you could move this round and drill through this hole here, but uh, I'll do it with a graver. And then uh, you can then begin to drill by hand, maybe with a carbide drill or a little spade drill like I showed on the, um, like I showed on the, uh, video thing that I did. So again, um, with jobs like this, I mean, it is kind of everybody's not exactly worse nightmare, but it's certainly something that you get into a job and you are maybe under a bit of pressure or you're learning as we're all learning and uh, you break the pivot off or the pivot has been broken off and didn't realize. Um, again, it can be done. Uh, so that's kind of, a, you know, you can do it. But work holding is always uh, a challenge there, basically. So um, great. OK, so that's kind of what I've been up to. On Monday uh, evening, we ran uh, a, an event with ICON, the Institute of Conservation. And in a few days' time, that video will be on YouTube. You can catch up. We spoke to a curator from Royal Observatory Greenwich, uh, um, Emily Ackermans, and we also spoke to Tabi Aruda, who's at the Vienna Clock Museum. And it's worth looking at the video when it comes out because they've got, I think she said, 7,000 uh, clocks there. So if you're interested in wooden clocks and the Black Forest clocks, really in, uh, important collection. And Tabi had talked about museum storage and inventory and things. So that was a good uh, horological evening and um what else has been happening oh well on saturday uh if you haven't seen it on social media or on the facebook group then we are running a christmas special um open clock club so that's saturday at uh six o'clock for one hour that's the 18th isn't it yeah saturday the 18th uh six o'clock that's 1800 gmt same as this event um, no idea what we're going to talk about yet. We'll think of something, but we're going to have a bit of a Christmas clock quiz. And those of you who were there last year will probably have the same questions. But um, so that will uh, that'll be good fun. Right. OK, so back to this escapement. So a couple of things from um, last week. 
I'm going to try and draw the escapement because I'm at a fork in the road with this clock, really. It needs to be done. I think we've dealt with everything else. Did a bit of um, bushing in this front uh, escape wheel pivot. Turn it the right way up. In this front escape wheel pivot. Checked everything else. Done some preliminary cleaning. But our pallets, well, both the escape wheel and the pallets are quite badly damaged. I think the escape wheel is salvageable. Quite a few of the teeth are short. Now, what that's going to mean is that some of the teeth, uh, some of the, yeah, the teeth have got bigger uh, drops than the other. So drop is free angular movement of the escape wheel and therefore the train of gears, the whole thing. And drop is uh, precedes the ticking sound that you hear when clocks are running. So you've got impulse, drop, and then that uh, percussive sound of the wheel tooth landing on the escape wheel pallet. Anyway, with this wheel, we're certainly not going to be able to get that perfect because there are lots and lots and lots of short teeth and damaged teeth. And the, the teeth are, to my eye, um, quite short in the first instance, but that's probably how they were when they were made. So that's that's cool. Um, there was a little bit of, um, not confusion, but a question from last week's event that cropped up on YouTube. And that somebody said, uh, this is not a deadbeat escapement. It's what in America, at least, is called a half deadbeat escapement. And I uh, thought I'd leave it till now to kind of clarify that a little bit. So this is not a half deadbeat escapement, at least in the UK. This is alluding to, if we can get in focus, um, a deadbeat escapement. So the, uh, there are two phases of the pallets. We talked about this last week, so don't have to go through this part of it again. But um, your pallet, if this is the uh, center, Uh, of your pallet arbor or the verge arbor, I think they call it in the States. Uh, we have to, again, to, to us, a verge is a totally different thing. But anyway, um, so there's a circle struck around that point, like that, let's call it. And that circle forms the locking or dead face of your pallets. So you've got one pallet usually here like this which is uh part of that circle believe it or not sorry excuse the drawing and another one uh that's like this so the tooth lands on here this rotates round you get impulse on this part of the pallet the tooth drops off here lands on here um there's a bit of supplementary arc you get impulse here and the tooth goes all the way around and lands on there again so that's a deadbeat escapement. And that's what this is. However, the way this thing is made, it means that effectively these um, what would be dead faces, at least all I can I've only ever seen one of these. So I haven't seen enough to kind of make a broader um, statement. Um, but uh, they're not part of this curve. What they are is a kind of approximation to that. So they're basically... Um, the pallets look something like this, They're a bit more curved than that, and you've got your little brass thing on there, like that. So um, they're, they approximate to those curves. They're basically kind of straight, which for the amount of supplementary arc you get here, so once the tooth, let's say it lands on there, the pendulum keeps swinging a little bit, and the pallets go in this direction, so this tooth gets deeper into the pallets. It's so tiny... And this thing doesn't have a seconds hand fixed straight to the escape wheel arbor. So you don't see that tiny bit of um, recoil or impulse or whatever it is. Um, but what you do get is you get a heck of a lot less. In fact, maybe a negative escapement error, which is why it was massively popular in these clocks. Um, it's not really to do with precision as such. It's to do with reducing or eliminating uh, escapement error in spring-driven clocks. Now, uh, in the UK, at least, a half deadbeat escapement is something completely different. It's, uh, it's where you've got basically um, 
two impulse planes. It's a kind of a schema that is used by people like Volumi in the end of the 18th and early 19th century that you see on uh, really kind of high quality clocks and turret clocks sometimes as well. Anyway, so um, let's just put that to one side for a sec. I'm at um, a fork in the road, as I said, because this is really the only thing now that's standing in the way of actually getting this clock done this side of New Year. What do I do about the pallets? So um, I was slightly confused last week because, uh, sorry, I will go back to my drawing because I'm thinking this through, thinking on my feet as always, which is a good thing, keeps my brain going. So uh, what somebody has done or appeared to have done here is, uh, well, let's draw the anchor or the verge or whatever you call it, this way up, the way up you see it in the clock. It's exactly the same as the drawing we just saw. So you've got part of a curve here, part of a circle, sorry, and there, and you've got an impulse phase plane there. And then on this side, you've got part of that very, very um, same circle. Let's just draw that coming around here and like that. And then you've got um, an impulse face, something like that. So the tooth is coming down in this direction, lands on here. There's a bit of supplementary arc with your pendulum going beyond the escaping arc. Then this moves back in that direction. The whole thing rotates around the verge arbor. Let's draw that in. And um, this tooth, or the equivalent of a theoretical tooth, lands on here. You get impulse on this bit that tooth exits and it goes all the way around and lands on there, which is great. But somebody at some time appears to have got into trouble uh, adjusting this thing. Don't know why, who knows how or why these things happen. Anyway, what's done is done. And we've all been in that situation where, well, I have anyway, where you get into a panic and you start bending things and filing things. And it appears that they've got to the situation Maybe the center distance has been closed up too much, but it looks like to me anyway, I don't know, I haven't seen enough of these clocks, that the pallet frame's actually been bent back. You can see it's kind of not straight here. I don't know whether that's how they were when they were new. Um, but by doing that, they've been decreased external drop. And um, is that right? So that is further around there. Yeah, so they decreased external drop and they've increased internal drop. So they've never been able to get the thing to work. And I think what's been happening is that the tooth here hasn't been clearing. So it's been jamming on this corner and the escapement hasn't been running. So what they've then done, it appears, well, they, I can see as which threw me last week, is they've started to file at this and they've filed quite a lot off. Okay, like this. So not only is the whole thing too short, um, but also there's no impulse on this uh, exit palette either. Uh, so, okay, so what to do? What's done is done and cannot be undone as this. This is kind of all right. Um, this is in, let me just get my eyeglass, have a look. I mean, I might tidy that up if we're going to start bending things. Uh, it's kind of okay, um, but this is no good at all, A, because it's too far out, and you could close up the centre distance with this uh, adjustable cock here for the pallets, um, and this maybe is further out than it was when it was new. I, I don't know, again, because I've not seen enough clocks, but um, the problem with that is that then you've got to move these two closer together because they appear to have been bent back, which is why the pallet frame looks a bit like that. So options, I've got options here. Um, I know for the anchor recoil uh, clocks, you can buy uh, verges from, I think in the States, there's companies called Time Savers and so on. I don't know those companies, but you can probably buy them here from Cousins or Walsh or eBay or whatever. So these are new uh, sets of pallets that embrace X number of teeth, um, which is fine. And um, I, But I don't know whether they're available for the deadbeat 
uh, version. I'm sure somebody will tell us in the comments either now or uh, during the week. Um, or we can just say this pair of palettes, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not massively familiar with this form of the deadbeat escapement, although I've done quite a lot of the sort of solid frame English type ones. Um, has been altered, which it definitely has on the exit palette. The question is, shall I just file a new impulse face on here? So basically file this back like this, which would mean, and this is broadly 45 degrees to the um, tangent, and then bend the whole thing back and try and get N and a half teeth. Or do I make a new set of palettes and just keep these and put them with the clock and start again. So what I'm gonna do is, I don't know, I, I know some of our followers on different uh, parts of the internet are quite good on CAD drawing. Um, I don't have CAD that I can show you at the moment. I'm not great on it. I used to be a lot better than I went off doing it. And uh, so this is quite an interesting um, uh, theory, I suppose. Um, if you're going to make something like this, and like me, you're not massively confident on doing it, then it's incredibly useful to draw it first. Now, I've lost my dividers. So that's not a good start. Okay. So let's have a look at our deadbeat escapement. I'm going to try without labouring it too much to draw it because I'm not sure this is shown in many other places on the internet. I know um, the British Horological Institute's um, distance learning program, they draw the deadbeat escapement, do a beautiful job of it. Um, but if you don't have that or have access to that, uh, I think if you're going to make a new pair of palettes, it's really useful to draw it first and whether you draw it on a bit of paper or whether you draw it in CAD. CAD's easier to be honest because obviously you can change things as you go along, you can print it, you can print it one to one size so when you actually make your palettes you can kind of lay them on top. Okay so to um, let's just again go back to our bit of theory here. So we've got um, our palettes whether it's um, uh, an anchor recall escapement, just like a regular clock, or whether it's a deadbeat escapement, the palettes must be N and a half, N for number and a half teeth apart. Okay. So if you think about this, um, or tooth gaps, teeth are tooth gaps. So every time this escape, one of these escape wheel teeth advances one full tooth space, there's actually been two ticks the pendulum swings to one side one tick swings to the other side one tick and um and uh, the escape wheels advanced one tooth so that means it must advance half a tooth space for every tick which is right so your palates embrace a number of teeth however many that is plus a half they have to do and these here don't they've been bent and that's why bending the palate frame is always such a a kind of bad idea. So that's one thing we need to figure out is how many teeth our palettes embrace. If you look at it like a um, regular 18th, 19th century European tall case clock, then they make life really simple. Of course they do, you know, why, why would you not want to do? So if you take your escape wheel here and, oops, drawing a bit big, and let's say it's got 30 teeth on it, Here's the center. Here's our palette arbor up here somewhere. It's got 30 teeth on this escape wheel. We know our palettes need to embrace n and a half teeth. So if we draw a line up here and another one up here, draw my um, escape wheel arbor in the wrong place, and we get a square. So 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, 90 degrees. Um, that is like the easiest thing to, if you're going to design an escapement, if you're interested in this and you want to get more into the theory and you want to start doing some drawing, then draw the escapement, anchor recall escapement of your standard um, sort of European long case clock. 
because you can draw it like this, what they call a square escapement. Um, and if you think about this, you've got 30 teeth. This is, if we turn it around there, you can see is a quarter of the wheel. So the pallets here are going to embrace a quarter of the teeth. And if we divide 30 by four, we get seven and a half, which is great. So easy life. We also know that um, this value here, the radius of the wheel, um, if we multiply that by the root of two to get the diagonal of that square, then, uh, which is 1.41 something, we get the center distance. So the square escapement with 30 teeth is a dead easy place to start. And then all you do is you decide what your impulse angles, we've gone through this on Open Clock Club, and then if the wheels go in that direction, you've got uh, basically a pallet face there, a pallet face there, something like that. And um, bingo, there's your pallets. Um, slightly ugly looking ones, but anyhow. Now with a deadbeat escapement, things are kind of the same. You need N and a half teeth. Doesn't matter whether it's this American clock escapement or a George Graham regulator from 1720. They've got, the theory is the same. Um, now our escape wheel here, we're gonna to need to first gather some data. Um, I think has got 48 teeth on it. So my mental math is absolutely hopeless. So you, some, oh, keyboard's just gone on the floor. Um, so some of you may remember the old uh, calculator. Um, but I think 12. Okay, great. So that's no good whatsoever because we want something and a half. Um, so this isn't going to be a square escapement. We know that from the off. I will just double check the um, number of teeth on here, but I'm pretty sure it's 48. Quickly count it. So it's got 48 teeth. So that's our first bit of data for our um, our data sheet there, 48 teeth. Um, we, do, we don't know how many uh, teeth the designer uh, intended, but we do have our original palettes, so we can kind of take a bit of a steer from there. But let's just look at um, the design uh, of this escapement. So let's just put a center here. So this is the center for our pallet arbor. And these are our pallets. And we know the absolute defining characteristic of a deadbeat escapement. Hope you can see that line on there. It's not super strong. Is that the dead faces of the pallets are part of a circle, which is constructed from the pallet arbor. Has to be, that's the whole kind of definition of it. Um, so if you've ever looked at a lot of turret clocks and you see deadbeat escapements, uh, sometimes you will see both pallets on one side of the wheel, which looks a bit crazy uh, when you first see it, but it doesn't matter. As long as those pallet faces are n and a half teeth, so one and a half, two and a half, three and a half, four and a half, five and a half, six and a half, whatever apart, doesn't matter. Some French regulators also have them arranged like that. So the um, the pallet faces might only be one and a half teeth uh, apart, which I think is like the Tompion clocks at Greenwich were the were the first clocks with a deadbeat escapement. That question might crop up in. Um, side of this quiz, might do. Anyway, so you sometimes see both uh, uh, teeth on both pallets on one side of the wheel. That's kind of unusual for the clocks that we tend to deal with every day. So we're gonna put one pallet on one side, entry pallet, and one pallet on the other side, exit pallet. But there's two broad ways of doing this. Okay, we know that the acting surfaces have got to be something and a half teeth apart. But you've got two different designs. Uh, one is called equal locking, 
and one is called equal impulse. And I think in the 18th century, there was lots of kind of different experimentation with this. TBH, I don't think it makes a hairpath of difference to the performance of the clock. In fact, I'm pretty sure it can't do whether you've got impul in, in equal impulse or equal locking, but I will just kind of explain what those two things are. So in fact, let's draw two um, uh, escape wheels and we can see them side by side. So there's one and there's the other. Okay, so this is our theoretical circle that's at N and a half uh, teeth apart. So this top one is going to have equal impulse. So I don't know, by the way, which of uh, these this clock has, um, if either, when it was designed. Maybe there is somebody out there who knows who has got drawings or an explanation of what, what happened at the uh, factory when they were designing them. And this one's going to be equal locking. Now there is um, uh, an advantage here if you're making the solid kind of palettes to have um, equal impulse palettes. And the reason for that is if you imagine a chunk of steel in the lathe and you turn a circle of uh, material, sort of a tube, if you like, that are going to become your palettes, they are equal impulse palettes. So you can just have one inner radius and one outer radius and life simple. If you're making them by hand and you're filing um, the, the two palette faces individually, then it doesn't really make it any easier. So equal impulse is like this. Uh, we've got our escape wheel going in this direction like that. So um, So there's our two palette, uh, palettes, and you can see our theoretical N and a half circle runs right down the middle of both of those palettes. So if you're gonna make a deadbeat uh, clock and uh, Derek, if he's still here with us on all this um, theory, then maybe he's gonna get the lathe out and knock out some deadbeat palettes, which would be great fun. This obviously is the easy way of doing it because you can basically make a circle uh, of steel and then you can chop it up and you've got your pallets they're done equal locking um is if you imagine you move this uh pallet face that way a little bit to that line you have to move this one this way to that line because you've got to maintain this number of teeth and a half um so equal locking would look something like this, like that. So the tooth lands on here, the tooth lands on here, oops, the tooth lands on there, and you can see they are locked at the same radius. Okay, if that's actually going up on the screen. So there we go, there's equal impulse, equal locking. TBH doesn't really matter for what we're dealing with here. If we can get the thing running and we can get the drops down, it's gonna be a bit of a, Party time, party time. Mustn't lose my bit of information there. Okay, the other, um, sorry, just before I move on to that, the other bit of information we need is how thick is this palette? I think we talked about this this week, last week, sorry, because this is critical information. If you think about it, again, each one of these palettes we've already established relates to half a tooth of um impulse or rotation of the escape wheel. So half a tooth on here, half a tooth spaced on here, one tooth altogether. So it's dead easy. This thickness is how far, uh, in a sense, your escape wheel rotates divided by two, less drop. If you make them so thick that they're half the pitch of the circle, then, um, then there's going to be no drop. So typically when you're making, like with the anchor recoil escapement, you make it so it's too much, too thick, no drop, and then you keep thinning and thinning and thinning until you generate 
like half a degree of drop or something like that. So that's where that value comes from, which is quite easy. And we can figure out actually uh, from in theory what that should be for our clock by, and sorry about the theory, it seems to be um, going in that direction tonight, but there you go. That's, uh, that's the nature of the beast, I'm afraid. Um, so if we were to measure, we want to figure out how far it is from one place on one tooth tip to the same place on the next tooth tip like that. So we want to figure out what is that value. Now, um, I don't know how to do that, but what I do know is what, how to figure out that value. So rather than a straight line, a curve, I'm sure uh, it can be done the other way quite easily, but I don't know how to do it. And to be honest, that difference is so tiny, it doesn't matter for us in terms of the length of the arc. So what we do is we get the frame apart, I'm gonna measure the diameter of the wheel, getting a bit better at um, getting this apart. So it's a good idea to have a kind of data sheet. If you use Excel or something like that, it's useful, but just draw a kind of graph. So we've got 48 teeth. Um, <coughs> pardon me. We've got wheel diameter, which will tell us the pitch. So the pitch is this, the value from the same place and one thing, whether it's a link on a bike chain, uh, to um, teeth on a teeth on a wheel. Uh, so to figure out the pitch, we need to know the diameter, which we can use that symbol. Let's just have a measure. Now, bearing in mind these teeth are all um, bent and damaged, I'm going to take two or three readings, measurements. Yeah, and uh, so that's 38.2 there. If you had um, a lathe with a dividing head on it and you've got your workshop set up and you've, um, yeah, that basically, you might just think, I know what, I'm just going to make a new wheel and new pallets to match, start from scratch and the job is done and it might actually be quicker than trying to rescue this but um there is of course that issue of preservation or as i said maybe you can buy these things off the peg i don't know 38.3 some of the teeth might be slightly longer because they've all been messed about with Thirty-eight point three. So I'm going to go with 38.3. I don't know, millimetre, whether these wheels were, just get a ruler. Um, these clocks presumably were made in Imperial. Um, might go rescue my... keyboard at some point. Yeah, I will. I'll go get it. It's on the floor. Uh, so let's just have a look at this. Um, Well, it looks alarmingly close to an inch and a half, which would make a whole lot of sense. Just start there. Inch and a half. Um, I've never, <laughs> I've never put this thing on inches before. That's a bit bigger than that, but I think that's too close to be a coincidence. So um, I'm going to stick with my 38.3 millimetres, but 
I, it looks like um, it looks like uh, it's an inch and a half diameter. Makes complete sense. Yeah, you hear about escape wheel topping. Uh, we can't. We could try topping here, uh, which will equalize um, the teeth uh, by taking some material off the longer ones. I think with topping, I have done it a few times. What you don't want to do is to refinish everything. It works really well on a wheel where you've got three or four, six maybe rogue teeth, and you want to bring the worst of them a little bit shorter. But topping, which is removing the tip of the tooth, does a couple of things. Of course, uh, Dell is absolutely right. It alters, um, uh, yeah, it alters the radius of the escape wheel. It makes it smaller but it increases drop and it increases drop because if this is our tooth here when it's new like that and you top it, then you cut the top off it basically. Then obviously it's thicker and this um, dictates the absolutely minimum amount of drop as well. So you've got more drop and uh, then you get into the situation where you begin to think about bending things and so on. So topping is, is a, an option on, um, on wheels uh, where you've got, as I said, where you've got three or four teeth you think are bad, but generally they're all okay. In this case, the teeth are already really short. So by the time you've topped it, you might have to recut the whole thing and then you might as well make a new wheel, I suppose. I just noticed. Uh, actually that the wheel is dished in as well so somebody's kind of a uh, dished it to make it run on a new piece of um uh pallet face so they've got into a real mess with the whole thing but yeah topping is certainly uh a, 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 an option but you're absolutely right uh del it affects uh the whole geometry of the schema so only do it as a a last um uh last ditch Panic, not panic, last ditch uh, effort. So um, we've got 38.3 millimeter diameter or inch and a half. We multiply that by pi, so 38.3 times 3.14 is close enough um, to give us our diameter of our circumference, which is 120.26 millimeters. And we divide that by 48. Um, divided by 48 is a 2.505. So um, we've got, I mean, that all is all with the pi rounded, uh, rounded pi, obviously that's slightly uh, um, inaccurate, but uh, we've got just over two and a half millimeters pitch. And of course, by the time you get that down to a straight line, um, I don't know what that is in, uh, in inches, somebody can work it out at some point. Um, so, good question. We know that um, two of these thicknesses of the pallets, so that plus that, minus drop, minus our tooth tip thickness that we've just talked about there, is um, what we need. So, uh, again, we, can, we could get into that with a CAD drawing, but um, we know that this um, thickness of this material cannot be more than um, half that, so 1.25 millimetres. So let's just have a little measure up. I need to move off um, off Imperial onto millimetres, I'm afraid. Sorry. Uh, so it's one millimetre or nearest damn it, which is really great because we've got some one millimetre steel uh, in stock somewhere. So um, we know that uh, we've got one on this side, one on this side, so that's two. So we've got 0.5 millimeter drop as a linear value. Obviously it's a rotational uh, value, but again, I'm sure somebody can figure that out as a number of degrees. Good. So we're kind of in the ballpark there. We've, we need one millimeter steel. We could probably get away with slightly thicker and then start filing it down so we can really reduce those uh, drops. But I don't have any in stock. I've only got one millimeter gauge plate. Okay. So let's just start and draw this. I must not lose my information. So we've got 
48 teeth, we've got 38.3 millimeter diameter wheel. Um, the other bit of information we need is the center distance. So when you're making a clock from scratch, it's great because you can decide what center distance you want. Normally, the pallets embrace at a tangent to the wheel. So the greater the center distance, you might see, if you look in books or maybe come across them, see 18th century clocks with deadbeat escapements, they tended to have really small amplitudes to get away from circular error. Um, and um, they would have a big center distance. And you, that's where that idea of the Graham anchor comes from, uh, uh, where you've got the long shank of the anchor like that. Whoops, going off the screen. And then you've got the pallets down, ah, down here like that. And they used to embrace, obviously, uh, maybe um, you know, a third or more, even half, the, uh, the number of teeth on the wheel. Um, now, we have a bigger amplitude than they've got on those old uh, regulators with massive pendulum bobs. Um, and we know we're kind of aiming for a quarter. So let's just have a look at that centre distance. So where are my rulers gone? Um, what I don't know here is that that pallet cock is where it was when it was new. And it's really tight. And I... There isn't much or any sign that I can see anyway of it being bent. So all I can do is take it that that is where it is, was when it was new. Unless I see two or three or four clocks, there's no way of really telling. Of course, on um, a clock with a solid frame, like the long case clocks behind us here, you can tell if it's been changed because you've got elongated holes or punched holes and plugged and that kind of thing. On this, I, I don't know enough about these clocks to tell. So let's have a pitch at this center distance, which is, it might be inch. No, it's less than inch. It's uh, 17 sixteenths. Which is about 24 millimeters. I think it's 17 six things. So let's just center distance equals 17. No, um, 15 16, sorry, or 24 millimeters. Let's just sanity check that. It's so easy to make a mistake unless you're really good with math and engineering and that kind of thing, which I'm not. Um, and then you start making something and you realize you made a mistake in your calculation. So 25.4, so many millimeters there are in an inch, divided by 16 equals times 15 equals, so 23.81. So let's call it 24 millimeters. So we've got that value. So the only other thing I think we need now is to figure out how many teeth the, this clock we believe when it was new uh, embraced. So let's just pop this scape wheel back in here. And uh, sorry if this is all a bit dry on the old um, theory front, but I think, uh, again, for those, of, you know, this is quite complicated. And um, I think if you get into a situation with a clock, you don't need to rely on somebody saying, oh, it's this, leave it to me kind of thing. You think, yeah, I can maybe have a go at that and actually um, at least figure it out and draw it out. Really helps um, focus the mind. So what I'm gonna do here is put, it doesn't matter which one you do, but put the tip of one escape wheel uh, tooth on the absolute, whoops, on the point where it is just dropping off um, the uh, pallet face, and I'm going to count how many gaps there are, how many tooth gaps. So there is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and a half, 
eight and a half. Good. So this is much less than uh, a quarter of the wheel. But you can see that there, if you just look at the crossings, we've got one near the crossing here, um, somewhere up there. So uh, there's a question, why didn't they make it input, uh, embrace more teeth? And the answer for that is that um, if you imagine it embraces more teeth, these arms are longer in relation to the length of the pendulum. For every n degrees of your pendulum swing, then these move more. So what they're after is a relatively small movement of the uh, pallet frame for a relatively large um, movement of the pendulum. And I suppose that helps in the other direction. If somebody gives the pendulum an enormous uh, push, then maybe it's less likely to uh, cause the pallets to dig into the, um, uh, dig into the uh, escape wheel. I don't know. Anyway, eight and a half. So let's just put that down you can see why it's useful to have a little data sheet here rather than this scroll that i write down so we've got eight and a half there so i think we are kind of done with taking information from this so let's just have um a go at drawing it i suppose with our going back to our um 30 hour long case clock type uh, description we've got a square escapement the beauty of that is it's easy to draw so if we get this, we take uh, 360 degrees, the full circle, and um, divide it by 48. So that's seven and a half degrees per tooth, which is quite a nice number. And then we multiply that by 8.5. And then we get 63.75, which if you've got CAD, uh, it's not a problem if you're doing it on your um, if you're doing it on a bit of paper like this. That's more uh, difficult, I suppose. What you could do is you can divide. Uh, I need to think about that. So we've got sixty three point seven five degrees embraced. So divided by two. So that's 31.875 borrowing numbers uh, on either side of the center line. So we need to have just a bit of a punt in the little bit of time we've got left uh, at drawing this. Now, um, on CAD, again, it's no problem because you can, uh, one of our followers on, oh gosh, on the other YouTube, whatever he sees this, um, uh, does both Fusion, which is a CAD software, and FreeCAD, which is free CAD drawing, and seems to make a really uh, great um, job of it as well. So um, uh, look him up. Bradford, his name is, um, I think, if I remember rightly. So we've got to think of a scale for this. So our wheel 38.3... Uh, if we went six times scale, two, two, 230 mil, 230 mil. Done my, um, 115, so that's 125 there. So I'm going to do it. Um, one to six ratio. So one in real life is six on our bit of paper. So this is our escape wheel. Um, just put a little center down here. Radius. This is going to work like that. Oh, you'd obviously want to do this a whole lot neater if you're actually relying on it to make something. But for the sake of this exercise, there's our center line. You could draw a real center line as well. I'm sorry, engineers out there will be kind of pulling their hair out. But anyway, 
Uh, so our center distance uh, is 24 mil. Um, so 24 times six equals 144. Just about fit on there. I'll, run, I'll do a center line, bit of a center line anyway. Thank you. So there, you can see if it's no bail calculator out the way. We've got our escape wheel radius and we've got our center for our um, pallets. Now we know that um, our pallets are embracing eight and a half teeth, which uh, relates to a crazy 63.75. Just thinking about this, what you could do is it would take a lot of doing in pencil, but maybe this is how they did it originally. Although I'm sure they had massive, bigger brains than me. Um, is that they, if you want to draw, um, maybe this is one of those questions. Look, sorry, not too much of a tangent, honest. Here's our, uh, let's just draw a circle. That's like the worst center line ever in the history of drawing circles, but anyway. By that, um, you you know why is a dial got twelve divisions? Well, the answer to that is because if you draw a circle like this, I wish I shouldn't do it twice. I get told off by my um, teachers, and then you uh, take that radius and you step it out six times, like this. it divides exactly so you can get a six hour dial then if you subdivide the um those values like this again with your compasses and you draw it to draw that to the center and do that on every one you can get a 12 hour dial just using a pair of compasses which you know ancient instrument so that's one uh, reason why a clock's got a 12 hour dial or a sundial or 12 hours, it's dead easy to draw it out. Whereas 10 hours is a total nightmare. You try dividing a circle by 10, much more difficult, I think. Anyway, so actually, um, if we had a bit big enough bit of paper and the patients, we could subdivide that 12 uh, again with our um, dividers like that. That would give us 24 divisions. And then all we do is we subdivide that again, like that, and that would give us 48. So we'd have our 48 teeth drawn out perfectly accurately with a pair of uh, compasses. And given if the wheel is an inch and a half in diameter and you get a big old bit of paper and a big old pair of compasses, um, you can draw that really beautifully accurately. And I imagine that's how it was done. So there you go. So maybe that's why the wheel's got 48 teeth on it. It's actually dead easy to draw. Um, but for us, uh, life isn't quite that simple because um, we don't have a, either a big enough bit of paper or the patience to do it, but it's perfectly possible to do it. So I'm just going to cheat. And this is like totally not the way to do it, obviously, um, but it'll give us a, an idea of what we want on the sides. Oh, did I turn the paper over? No. I have my um, data sheet stuck up on, a, on the computer there so I can see it. So we've got uh, 63.75 divided by two equals 31.87 degrees. So very roughly, this is not the way to do it, but it'll get us started. So what do we say, uh, 30, if we had divided that wheel with our compasses, 
we would have something that looks like that. That's great. So what we can do now, again, if we uh, did this on CAD, it would be a lot better because you can generate a circle if we're still on the page, yes we are, from there. Um, I can. You can generate a circle from here. I thought that looked a bit strange. Too many bits of paper. Like that. And we know that this uh, now embraces. Um... <laughs> yes, sorry, I've probably not held the thing in front of the camera. There we go. So we've got a center of our escape wheel. We've got our center distance between our pallet frame and our um, escape wheel. And we've now got um, eight and a half uh, tooth spaces embraced. Uh, which would have been better to do it by geometry. So what we can do now is we can generate the radius of our pallets. We know that um, our pallet arbor is here. Put that on there, that and that. It's not bad actually considering. So that is the uh, radius of our pallets. And again, if you imagine you were drawing this on a uh, CAD, for instance, you can pop that in there, then you can decide whether you want equal locking or equal impulse, as we um, talked about before. And uh, then you can begin to put that in. So we know how much um, our escape wheel rotates um, for every uh, uh, half tick. It rotates half the value of half a tooth space. But what about the pendulum? How much does the pendulum? uh swing if you like well uh that's a really good question because you can basically design it to do what you want we've talked on open clock club a lot about this thing called supplementary arc and escaping arc so when a clock is running like a regular clock that's been repaired it runs at supplementary arc but you'll notice if you watch the pendulum it swings then there's a tick then there's a little bit more swing on a recoil clock. That's where the recoil happens. And there has to be that extra bit of arc um, for the thing to run reliably. But what we're interested in here is designing in how much the pendulum has to swing before it ticks, what they call escaping arc. So that's how much uh, from one side to the other. Um, and let's say that is, uh, four degrees altogether. It's usually about six, I think, on a long case clock, but let's call it four degrees here. So it doesn't really matter which way we draw this for the sake of this exercise. Let's draw a line there, like that. And uh, we want, um, let's say that's the point um, where our escape wheel tooth has just landed on this pallet. So it's just landed on our exit pallet. Okay. So we know that the pallets and therefore the pendulum, because they're fixed together effectively by one, are going to rotate so much before it ticks onto the next pallet. That's how much your pendulum's got to swing. Now, of course, you can't just keep increasing that, increasing, increasing, or decreasing it to nearly nothing. Well, you kind of can, but um, obviously the more you increase it, the more energy you have to put into the system to maintain that as well. So uh, let's, again, incredibly poorly just drawing four degrees here or thereabouts. There's our four. By next week, I've got a feeling I'm not going to have any time, but... Um, 
it'd be lovely to do something on CAD. Okay, so if that's where our um, pallets landed, uh, escape wheel tools landed on the pallet, and that's where it left, we want the opposite on this pallet um, as well. So in this position, uh, let's just draw our line in there for our impulse face like that. But I don't know if you can see there, but um, this is basically our palettes are beginning to form now. Hopefully this makes some kind of sense. Like that, we've got our exit palette in place. And we want exactly the same on the other palette. So we know that if this tooth has just landed on uh, the just inside the locking corner, we haven't drawn in that half a degree or something for locking here, trying to keep it relatively simple. Um, we know that on this tooth, it has just exited at the same exact same time again less drop so this is equal impulse so we need to draw this is the exit corner um like this to that point so we need to draw four degrees in this direction You would obviously never do it this way with a protractor, but it gives you some idea. And then again, if you join uh, those lines up, for sake of this, um, you know, wrong direction, sorry. Uh, let me get this right. So that's just left. Sorry. Like that. Then we have... No, I'm even confusing myself. Sorry, I was right in the first first place uh, like that. Made a mistake there. Sorry about that. Um, so we would also generate our um, in, uh, entry palette face there. And you can see we can join those up. There we are. Sorry about that. There we are. So you can see we've got um, our four degrees on this side and four degrees on this side. They're the same thing happening at the same time um, and then you could if it was on CAD again it'd be really easy to print this at real size and then you can actually in our case where we've got a bit of metal that we want to bend round to make our pallets you can actually place them on top so that's the basic theory about how you would go about if you've got time and you've got an interest in doing this kind of thing then um, then that would be an incredibly useful, uh, incredibly useful thing to do, because if you can kind of get your head around the theory of the, I'd start with the anchor recoil escapement. I'll just draw this in in red. Sorry about that. like that as far as our um, palette frame if you draw if you get a hang of the theory then when you get a clock that's been uh, changed as this one has or somebody's bent something or filed something you don't have to think the only way out of this is to either not do it or buy another clock like it and get the parts of it or get new palettes you can actually begin to suss it out and draw it out both anchor recoil and deadbeat and if you've never done this as much as this uh demonstration of theory was a bit on the hoof i'm sure there are people on youtube who draw it beautifully and explain it really well it is well worth the effort because what it means is you might never do it but at least you'll have the kind of mastery of the clock and when you see this it won't freak you out um, same for the deadbeat escape, and I think a lot of people who have never worked on them, you know, like the solid frame type ones that we tend to see over here at least, they see it and they think it's like something that they can never get their head around. It absolutely isn't. Drawing it both equal impulse 
and uh, equal locking, you've kind of mastered it because they're pretty much all the same, at least from a perspective of uh, of theory. So who knew it was going to be an evening of um, of theory? But there you go. It's just. Uh, that's, how, that's the way it goes, I suppose. So where does that leave us in the last minute with our little clock? Well, I'm going to try and do both. I'm going to try and draw it out on CAD and make a new palette frame. And I'm also going to, because I don't think there's anything to lose at all with this one. And it's more likely that you will find yourself in this situation where it kind of, there's like zero locking uh, it's all over the place. So how would we go about bearing in mind what we know now about the end and the half teeth and everything of trying to rescue this one? It depends how far I get during the week. I've got a feeling that next week, what we'll do, as I say, we've got nothing to lose with these pallets now. They're never going to work in this clock. So um, what I'm going to do is to file a new impulse face on this exit pallet and try and bend them in so we've got equal drop then we can try um, sort of adjusting the thing and trying to get it to work. And maybe if I can do a CAD drawing, we'll also uh, do um, make a new pair as well. Not quite sure how they bend these round. I do, as I said before, I don't think it's actually bent as part of a curve. I think they just bend them round and they're basically straight. But um, anyway, Dell has got a headache. It's maybe from that paint, Dell, off your new lathe. Maybe that's what's giving you a headache. Uh, anyway, so... Um, apologies for <laughs> apologies for that. Probably not what people were expecting. Certainly not what I was expecting. But uh, there you go. At least we talked about the wax chuck. Um, need to do more myself. A little bit rusty, as you can see. But anyway, thank you for Dell. At least has stuck it out to the end. <laughs> so thank you for that. And uh, I think we're going to be here next week. On let me just check. Da, 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 what day is it next week? I've probably lost the thing now. Um, it's the 23rd, isn't it? I wonder whether you're still there. Oh, you are. You do appear to be there. 23rd. So, yeah, I think we'll be here on the 23rd. Oh, Jeremy is still there. Uh, well done, Jeremy, for sticking out. You deserve a um, glass of uh, something after that. Uh, but everybody, anybody does. And Andrew. Yeah, well, Andrew, uh, take it all with a bit of pinch of salt, but um, it's the, the basics are there. If you get into trouble, measure everything, make a little data sheet, preferably not on 10 bits of paper, draw it out to scale, and you will begin to get the feeling of uh, what you're after. And at least you'll be able to suss out all clocks uh, better. And thank you, Franklin. So, yeah, all being well, we'll see you next week. If you're around on... Saturday. Ah, uh, Jeremy, yeah. If you're not on Facebook, Jeremy, um, it's on LinkedIn and it's on uh, Twitter. You're on Twitter, aren't you? So what I'll do is I'll uh, message you it on Twitter in a minute. It was on earlier in the day. Um, so it's through Eventbrite as before for Saturday. You can't use the old link. It's a new invitation, but we'll see you there for our, we'll have our Christmas uh, party hats on on Saturday. We'll have a bit of a quiz. One of those questions might be about the half dead beat of Skater, but anyway, um, I don't know. I've, I've got to uh, think what we're going to do. Anyway, lovely to see you. If uh, don't see you again, have a great Christmas and a happy new year. Otherwise, we'll be back on Saturday. Then I think um, I'm here next Thursday. We'll be back and we will try and get this little escapement going, which will be a little bit lighter duty than this week. Thanks very much and bye for now. Thank you.